it's pretty internationally international. <laughs> okay. Unlike Len Lenina, good. Now I see her name. I like to laugh at her. <laughs> I really prefer it. Uh... <laughs> Jonathan, are you there? Yes, I'm there. I'm here. Okay, let me introduce. Uh, can you? I saw your faces, so Dan can meet you guys, and Lenina. Is Jonathan from it? Is our IT uh, guy from I uh, director? Let's give him a title from the community <laughs> board twelve. Paola is the uh, assistant. Hi. Hi. The nice district manager's you. assistant. She's the one that makes things happen, and Ebenezer is the big boss, right here to the right. All right. Uh, he's the district manager Hi, for Community Board 12. Really nice uh, to meet you all. Dan, Lenina, Lenina, and the rest of the guys, I don't have you seen them. Jonathan, I think I made a mistake of uh, lending my uh, my link to another person. If you can please change it to attendee. See. Do you know who is it? The person that has no uh, okay, one has a picture, me. the one with the picture. All right. Do you know his name? Uh, he could just Maria. All right, um, just one information for all of you guys. Actually, uh, we are live on YouTube. Just in case you um, need to share um, our channel with any of your fellows. Um, channel name is um, CB12MNYC. That's the name of the channel on YouTube. YouTube channel. Okay, cool. I repeat, CB12MNYC. That's the channel name on YouTube. Very cool. Then so, we just joined in Domingo Estevez, the chair of our Business Development Committee. He's right there. Dan, Domingo, Lanita, and the rest of the gang. And Breeze. Domingo, can you hear me? Domingo? He's I think he's in. working on his audio. I okay. only see a okay. camera. Yeah, I think he's okay. working on it. Um, I don't, you don't actually need me on the video, Dan, right? Okay. You're muted. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Take me a minute. But yeah, no, whatever. Do, do as you like. I just... Because I don't want it to get confusing. The, the probably the people who are presenting should just be visible, and then that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> I like that magic trick. <laughs> Mingo, you on? Hi, guys. Hey. Hi. Can you all hear me? Okay. Yep. Okay. Great. Hey, Domingo, I finally see your phone, uh, Barbara. Domingo, can you hear? Uh, Domingo is mute. Let me try to mute him. Now I'm mute him. Text. Okay. You Domingo, hear me? Yes. Yeah, I hear him. Right, I was just making the introductions of uh, Domingo Estevez from the Manhattan. This is the chair of the Business Development Committee. You have Dan Pepitone from Manhattan Legal Services, Lelina, Benjamin, who am I seeing, Caddy, who am I just met, and the rest of the gang. Domingo, you meet everyone. Nice to meet you.
Um, I just wanted to say too, with the translation, Vanina and Rosa, who's gonna be joining shortly, they're gonna kind of alternate between. Um, so I think our order is me, Alex, Katie, Ben, Bree, Ryan, Alexandra, um, back to me and then the Q&A. So Rosa and the Nina are gonna kind of switch it up, but for some of the longer ones, uh, they're going to break it up between them. So if you just wait for them to complete, I think there's like two or three times where they rotate back and forth a few times. Thanks, Dan. In terms for our own knowledge, like how much, like how often should we be stopping to allow the translators to translate? Or do you want us to go through our whole like five minutes and then have them translate? Or should we take pauses in between? Yeah, you can go through your whole thing and then they're right. going to just do it right after. Okay, and if anybody's in the license in the get licensing in the business development committee just and you're an attendee just make sure you raise your hand and i'll i'll make you a co-host does anyone see rosa No, Rosa is not there. Um, I see William Garcia is raising his hand. Um, Domingo, um, let's see how. Okay, William, you can talk right now. Hi, everybody. This is William Garcia. How's everyone doing? Good. Good. How are you? Good, good. Thank you uh, all for uh, taking time and uh, joining uh, CB12 uh, in assisting the community and informing the community. For sure. Happy to Thank help. You. Eliasar, uh, William Garcia, he's going to be a panelist. He need to talk. He need to be promoted to panelist. I promoted him already. Thanks. Uh, I may not be saying anything other than thank you, um, Eliasar. But thanks for allowing me in. Yeah, Domingo just promoted. Yeah, so we're all here. Let me get a a few more people that are texting me that they want to join in. Hang on. Yeah, I think we're just waiting for Rosa. She's just having, a, I think you're on now, Rosa, but maybe you don't have the ability to unmute. I can unmute myself. Okay, I was uh, confused because it had me under a different name, but I was able to change it. Okay, cool. Hello, mandaste el mismo tuyo personal pues. yo le yo le acabo de cambiar el nombre a, eh, y le puse Ashley ok está bien tú me dices hey Ashley hey Domingo how are you good good hello 
Ashley. Kylie, it's our. Can you guys hear me okay? Am I choppy? No, you sound perfect. Uh, sound like you got a good quality mic there. Oh, wow. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, do we want to give it to 405 to have folks join? Because I see that the attendees list is growing. 405? Sure. Okay, so it's 4.05. Um, if you're on the live, I encourage folks to, if you're on social media, just make sure you share it, repost it. Um, today we have a all-star panel um, accompanied by our committee meeting, our business development committee meeting. Um, and I would just give me one second. Uh, so last week when we had our commercial leases, contracts and insurance conversation, there was a lot of follow-up questions and the chair basically instructed that we repeat a similar conversation to be able to clarify and, and be able to provide more insight as well as make sure that uh, we invited a broader uh, group of individuals. So um, that was the logic behind that. Um, and with that said, um, my name is Domingo Estevez. I'm the chair of the Business Development Committee. Uh, we've started a series called What You Need to Know, where we, uh, we, we hope to inform uh, business owners and small business owners on just insightful, um, uh, be able to provide some insight as to what are, what's out there, what, 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 what resources are out there, and, and make sure that, that we share that information. Um, along that route, uh, I would also like to welcome uh, our Community Board 12 Chair, uh, Elias El Bueno, if you want to say a few words. Oh, uh, hi, Domingo. Thank you for the kind introduction. 
I'd like to be extremely grateful to uh, William Garcia for connecting the dots, for hearing my, my plea of, of crying to get help from organizations uh, such as the one that Dan had and a few others, and I'm gonna just kind of like mention their names. Uh, small, uh, one, of, one would be start, start small, think big, uh, Manhattan Legal Services, Demand Justice, Gibson Dunn, Viva Uptown, and Juan Pablo Duarte Foundation. Thank you all for being part of what uh, I think is gonna be the ultimate uh, help that this community is gonna need, which is legal advice, legal help. Uh, William, thank you, and Domingo, uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, uh, make the introduction, thanks. Sure, so with that being said, um, we would like to start, who, who should we start off with first, Elisel? Oh, I'll go first. Dan okay. Pepitone, yeah. Yeah, hi, I'm Dan Pepitone. I'm an attorney at Manhattan Legal Services. Um, and we have a number of people from Start Small, Think Big and Gibson Dunn, who are gonna talk about an array of topics, including financial assistance programs, leases and commercial property, contracts, employment, and tax and insurance issues. Uh, two of my colleagues will help us translate today's session into Spanish. Rosa Costa is a paralegal in our Disability Advocacy Project, and Lenina Trinidad is a senior staff attorney in our Family Law Unit. Manhattan Legal Services, or MLS, is part of Legal Services NYC, which has offices in every borough, and we have been fighting poverty and seeking racial, social, and economic justice for over 50 years. We provide free legal services to low-income individuals and small businesses. Last year, Manhattan Legal Services helped over 15,000 people with civil legal problems in the areas of housing, immigration, government benefits, supplemental security income, disability, unemployment insurance, family law, domestic violence, consumer, and education law. Manhattan Legal Services es parte de Legal Services NYC, que tiene oficinas en cada distrito, y hemos estado luchando contra la pobreza y para obtener justicia racial, social y económica por más de 50 años. Brindamos servicios legal, legales gratuitos de alta calidad a personas de bajos ingresos y a pequeños comercios. En el último año, Manhattan Legal Services ayudó a más de 15,000 personas con problemas legales civiles en las áreas de viviendas, inmigración, beneficios gu gubernamentales, seguridad de ingreso suplementario, discapacidad, seguro de desempleo, familia, violencia doméstica, consumidores y ley educativa. Thank you, Rosa. Um, I have a small project dedicated to uh, self-employed individuals, and I focus primarily on artists and sole proprietors. Generally, my work involves contracts, copyright, and trademark. Uh, since the start of the pandemic, I'm focused on helping individuals determine their eligibility for unemployment insurance programs and also with contract issues, for instance, inability to perform, renegotiations, drafting, and updating sales contracts. I refer clients that I cannot personally help to other organizations like Start Small, Think Big, and to volunteer attorneys like those uh, you'll hear from today from Gibson Dunn. Tengo un pequeño proyecto dedicado a los trabajadores autónomos y se enfoca principalmente en los artistas y en los propietarios únicos. Generalmente mi trabajo involucra contratos, derechos de autor y marcas registradas. Desde el comienzo de la pandemia me enfoqué en ayudar a las personas a determinar su elegibilidad para los programas de seguro de desempleo y a resolver problemas con contratos, incapacidad de presentarse, renegociaciones, bocetar, actualizar plantillas de contratos de ventas y otros. Derribo a los clientes que no puedo ayudar de manera personal a otras organizaciones como Start Small, Think Big y a abogados voluntarios como los que nombrará Gibson Dunn. And I just wanted to mention quickly some of the unemployment insurance options. Uh, while most small business owners are not eligible for traditional unemployment insurance, many are eligible for pandemic unemployment assistance or PUA. 
PUA is a new program created by Congress to help more people who have lost income to the 19. Many self-employed individuals will be eligible for 39 weeks of benefits between January 27th and December 30th, 2020. In New York, the minimum weekly award is either $172 or $182, depending on the month, and the maximum is uh, $504 per week. Because of another program, a pandemic in, uh, emergency unemployment compensation, which gives recipients of UI and PUA an additional $600 each week between April 5th through July 31st, people who are eligible for PUA could receive between $3,300 and $4,700 each month from April through July. PUA benefits without the $600 extra are available for weeks between January 27th and April 5th and also beyond through the end of the year. The application has some confusing questions and we are trying to guide as many people as we can to help them secure this benefit. For more information on this or other issues, call us at 917-661-4500 and look for information on our website, legalservicesnyc.org. Between our organizations and other volunteer lawyers, we hope that many people will receive one-on-one -on -one consultations with lawyers for free. So please reach out to us. Me gustaría agregar que mientras que la mayoría de los dueños de comercios pequeños no son elegibles para seguros de desempleo tradicionales, muchos son elegibles para la asistencia de desempleo por pandemia. PUA es un nuevo programa creado por el Congreso para ayudar a más personas que perdieron su ingreso a causa de COVID-19. Muchos trabajadores autónomos serán elegibles para recibir 39 semanas de beneficios entre el 27 de enero de 2020 y el 30, 30 de diciembre de 2020. En Nueva York, la indemnización semanal mínima es 172 dólares o 182, lo que depende del mes, y la máxima son 504 dólares. En conjunto con otro programa, la compensación de desempleo por emergencia de pandemia que le otorgó a los beneficiarios del UI y de la PUA 600 dólares adicionales del 5 de abril de 2020 al 31 de julio de 2020. Las personas que son elegibles para la PUA podrían recibir entre $3,300 dólares y $4,700 dólares antes de la de deducción de impuestos cada mes desde abril hasta julio. Los beneficios de la PUA sin los $600 dólares adicionales están disponibles para las semanas que van desde el 27 de enero de 2020 hasta el 5 de abril de 2020. La solicitud tiene algunas preguntas confusas y estamos tratando de guiar a la mayor cantidad de gente posible para que se aseguren este ingreso. Para obtener más información sobre este y otros temas, llámanos al 917-661-4500 y busque información en nuestro sitio web uh, Legal Services NYC. Uh, entre los abogados de nuestra organización y otros voluntarios, esperamos que muchas personas reciban asesor asesoramiento gratuito personalizado con abogados. Póngase en contacto con nosotros. Hi, uh, my name is Alex Stepik and I'm the legal program director at Start Small Think Big. Uh, Start Small Think Big is a nonprofit organization based in Harlem. Uh, but operating nationally that supports low to moderate income under-resourced small businesses with transactional legal as well as financial planning, marketing, and sales guidance. Uh, we use a combination of in-house expertise and an extensive network of volunteers at top law firms and corporations like Gibson Dunn. We work with full-time clients for 12 months at a time across the three areas, financial, legal, and marketing, to provide holistic, connected for the business. Uh, we also developed a COVID-19 rapid response program 
through which we can offer a support for a range of legal, financial, and marketing issues that stem from COVID-19 and the shutdown, as well as guidance on eligibility for CARES Act programs like the Paycheck, Paycheck Protection Program and direct assistance applying for loans or grants. Uh, you can find an application for this level of one-to-one -one assistance that continues on a rotating basis until all needs are served, um, and it will route you either through our rapid response or full client application, as well as uh, show you a wide range of webinars and other paper resources that can help in the current crisis um, for your business and more generally on our website at startsmallthinkbig.org. Or for this project and for COVID-19 related questions, if you have anything that you're looking to find out about, you can reach out, of course, to Dan and his project or to us at response at startsmallthinkbig.org. Start Small, Think Big es una organización sin fines de lucro con base en Harlem que ayuda a comercios pequeños de pocos recursos con ingresos bajos a moderados en cuestiones legales de transacciones, en la planificación financiera y en asesor asesoramiento de marketing y ventas. Utilizamos una combinación de conocimientos propios y una extensa red de voluntarios de firmas y corporaciones legales de renombre. Trabajamos con nuestros clientes a tiempo completo por 12 meses a la vez en esas tres áreas para brindarles apoyo holístico y conectado para su comercio. También desarrollamos un programa de respuesta rápida ante la COVID-19. A través de este programa podemos ofrecer ayuda para solucionar una amplia gama de asuntos legales, financieros y de marketing que se derivan de la COVID-19 y del cierre comercial, como así también asesoramiento sobre elegibilidad para los programas de la ley CARES, como el programa de protección de cheques y asistencia directa para solicitar préstamos y subsidios. Puede encontrar una solicitud de asistencia que lo lleva a nuestra solicitud de respuesta rápida o de cliente completa junto con seminarios web y otros recursos, recursos, tanto para esta crisis como para su comercio en general en nuestro sitio web www.startsmallthinkbig.org. Si tiene preguntas, puede enviarnos un correo electrónico a response.startsmallthinkbig.org. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie Marquardt. I'm the pro bono counsel at Gibson Dunn. Um, I hope everyone is well and healthy and safe uh, today. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, Gibson Dunn is a global law firm. Uh, we have 20 offices around the world. Our largest office is here in New York City. We have more than 1,300 lawyers that work on all types of matters ranging from large litigations to real estate deals, um, M&A deals, uh, tax issues, employment issues, and beyond. Um, one of the things that I certainly and the firm is most proud of is our firm's commitment to pro bono and community service work. Um, our lawyers across the firm do pro bono work on a regular basis. Um, And that has only sort of increased in the wake of the, the COVID-19 pandemic that we all find ourselves in right now. Um, just to give you a sense of the scale of our program, last year, 91% of our attorneys participated in our pro bono efforts, um, doing at least 100 hours for each of those lawyers. Um, we work on a multitude of types of issues ranging from immigration to veterans benefits. We work with domestic violence survivors, Um, and what I think is probably most relevant for this group and this meeting today is that our lawyers work regularly with small businesses and nonprofits on a variety of issues ranging from starting up a small business or a nonprofit to running the day to day to dealing with issues that crop up, whether they be litigation or transactional focused, um, and of course, helping those small business and nonprofit clients, whether crises like we find ourselves in today. Um, our lawyers, including um, Alex, Bree, Ben, and Ryan, who you'll be hearing from today, have um, been reaching out to the small business and nonprofit community and trying to provide information like you're going to be hearing today. And we've also been working with LSNYC and Start Small Think Big 
to take on individual small business and nonprofit clients um, to provide specific help on their issues. Um, and we look forward to continuing to doing that, to continue doing that as this crisis um, continues to unfold. And uh, we hope that we can be helpful today and, and going forward. Thank you so much for inviting us to join you today. Gibson, Dunn y Crutcher con más de 1,300 abogados en 20 oficinas en las ciudades más importantes en Estados Unidos, Europa, Oriente Medio, Asia y Sudamérica, está comprometido con brindar la mayor calidad de servicios legales a sus clientes. No, más del 90% de los abogados asociados con Gibson y Dunn hacen trabajo pro bono y, y asistan con servicios legales y las otras agencias que están presentando hoy. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben. I'm an attorney at Gibson Dunn, and I'm going to talk a bit about some of the Small Business Administration's financial assistance programs that they're offering during this COVID-19 pandemic. In particular, I'm going to focus at a high level on the Paycheck Protection Program, or PPP, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, or EIDL, and then the debt relief options that the SBA is offering for other loans. Starting with the Paycheck Protection Program, or PPP, this is a loan for small businesses that were in operation on February 15th, 2020. Uh, it's a loan available to small businesses with fewer than 500 employees, also, uh, you don't need employees to be eligible for the loan. Sole proprietors, independent contractors, and self-employed individuals are also eligible for the Paycheck Protection Program. The loan itself is a loan uh, that's calculated as 2.5 times the average monthly payroll costs of the business, up to a maximum amount of $10 million. Now, there are more particulars with how to calculate the average monthly payroll cost, for instance, wage compensation over $100,000 for an employee is excluded from that calculation. Likewise, for sole proprietors, independent contractors, and self-employed individuals, payroll costs means the individual's income from self-employment because obviously they don't have employees, so they don't have payroll costs. The PPP loan can be used for a number of purposes, including payroll costs, interest on debt obligations like mortgage incurred before February 15th of this year. It can be used on rent under lease agreements that were enforced before February 15th. Uh, and it can be used on utilities for which service began before February 15th. Now, even though the loan can be used for each of those purposes, at least 75% of the loan proceeds must be used for payroll costs. Uh, you can tell by the name of the, the loan, the Paycheck Protection Program, that the purpose of the loan is to uh, maintain employee headcount and salaries, which is where this 75% uh, requirement comes from. Now, as long as at least 75% of the loan is used on payroll costs, uh, the loan will be fully forgiven if uh, the business maintains its full-time employee headcount, comparing the headcount to the full-time employee headcount in the previous year, so last year, and as long as employees' salaries or wages um, are not reduced by more than 25%. Um, so as long as the full-time headcount maintains the same and the salaries and wages don't decrease by that 25% amount, the full loan amount will be forgiven uh, uh, to cover costs that uh, are incurred for payroll costs during the eight-week period after the loan is dispersed. So um, that's a great benefit of this program. If the headcount changes or the salaries and wages are reduced by greater than 25%, the loan forgiveness will be reduced proportionally and the outstanding amount 
uh, will be a two-year loan at a 1% interest rate uh, with loan repayments deferred for the first six months. So there would be an amount that's not forgiven and it would be subject to those terms. A few other things to note about the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, in order to qualify or be eligible for the program, uh, a business needs to certify that current economic uncertainty makes the loan request necessary to support the ongoing operations of the business. There are some other certifications, but that's the key certification that needs to be made in order to be eligible for the loan. Uh, to apply for this program, rather than applying directly through the Small Business Administration, uh, businesses apply through banks participating in the program. Many banks are participating in the program and you can find those using a search tool on the SBA's website that allows you to locate participating banks. That being said, and you may have seen this in the news, there's been high demand uh, with regard to this program. Um, uh, I, as of the other day, I know the Treasury Secretary announced that just last week, 2.2 million loans uh, were, were granted. Uh, so there's high demand for this program. As a result, some banks are not accepting applications at this time or only extending uh, the opportunity to apply to existing customers. So it's important in looking around uh, that you find a bank that's currently uh, accepting applications. Again, this can change in the coming days and weeks as we've seen over the past month, there's been increased funding for the program which has allowed additional uh, banks to accept applications. So, uh, it's changing on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it's on a first-come, first-served basis. So if you're interested in the program, uh, you know, we would recommend applying sooner rather than later. The second program that I'm going to discuss is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. That's for businesses that were in operation on January 31st of this year. The Economic Injury Disaster Loan is a working capital loan up to $2 million, which can be used to pay fixed debts, payroll, accounts payable, and other bills that could have been paid had the pandemic not occurred. That being said, um, although a business can apply for both the EIDL loan and the PPP loan, the two loans can't be used for the same purpose. So for example, uh, the PPP loan and an EIDL loan cannot both be used to cover the same payroll costs during the same period. They need to be used for different purposes. The EIDL loan uh, doesn't have forgiveness terms like the PPP loan as a 3.75% interest rate for most businesses, a 2.75% interest rate for nonprofits with up to a 30 year loan term with loan repayments deferred for one year. Uh, there's also an emergency advance available up to $10,000, uh, which does not need to be repaid. Unlike the PPP loan, you would apply for the EIDL loan uh, directly through the SBA on the SBA's website. I will say right now, again, due to high demand, the SBA is only accepting applications from agricultural businesses. Again, this is because of the demand and the limited funding for the program. But this may change again in the coming weeks and months and they may open up the application process to uh, additional types of businesses beyond agricultural businesses. The last SBA uh, financial assistance program that was discussed is debt relief that the SBA is offering for um, other types of loans. So the SBA is paying six months of principal interest and any other fees that borrowers may owe for all current 7A, 504, and micro loans that are in regular service uh, servicing status. So it's current loans in addition to those types of loans, as long as they're dispersed prior to September 27th of this year. There's no application process to take advantage of this financial assistance. Uh, the SBA is automatically uh, paying these fees. 
And I'll conclude by saying there are, of course, financial assistance options available beyond those that the SBA is offering. Some you can look up on the website of Empire State Development. Empire State Development is New York State's economic development agency. They have some listed on their websites. And in addition, each bank uh, is offering its own types of financial assistance. For example, many are waiving late fees or overdraft fees. So those may be an option for small businesses in addition to the Small Business Administration's loan programs. Thank you. Esta sección tiene que ver con los programas de ayuda de administración de comercios pequeños, uh, que en inglés se llama Small Business Administration o SBA, SBA. El, pro, el, tiene el programa de protección de cheques que se llama Paycheck Protection Program o PPP. Uh, tiene préstamos por daños económicos, uh, Economic Injury Disaster Loan, que se llama EIDL, y también ayuda para deudas de SBA. Um, el programa de protección de cheques, um, el PPP, es para comercios en funcionamiento al 15 de febrero de 2020. El monto del préstamo máximo es igual a 2.5 um, los costos de la nómina mensuales promedio incurridos en el último año hasta 10 millones de dólares. Se excluyen algunos costos de la nómina, por ejemplo, compensaciones sal salariales de más de uh, 100 mil dólares sobre una base anualizada. Para los propietarios únicos, los contratistas independientes y los trabajadores autónomos, los costos de la nómina son los ingresos del trabajo autónomo. El préstamo puede ser utilizado para cubrir costos de la nómina, intereses sobre obligaciones de deudas, por ejemplo, hipoteca, incurridos antes del 15 de febrero de 2020. Renta de contratos de alquiler vigentes antes del 15 de febrero de 2020 o servicios públicos si el servicio se dio, se dio de alta antes del 15 de febrero de 2020. Se perdonará todo el préstamo si el comercio mantiene a todos los empleados a tiempo completo al comprar la cantidad de, de empleados a comparar la, perdón, al comparar la cantidad de empleados con la del año anterior y los salarios o sueldos de los empleados y si al menos el 75% del préstamo se utiliza para costos de nóminas durante el periodo de ocho semanas posterior al desembolso del préstamo. Si el comercio reduce su número de empleados a tiempo completo o sus salarios o sueldos más del 25%, o si más del 25% del préstamo se utiliza para cubrir costos de nóminas, el monto perdonado se, se reducirá proporcionalmente. De lo contrario, es un préstamo a dos años con una tasa de interés del 1% y la devolución del préstamo comienza luego de los primeros seis meses. Debe certificar que la falta de certeza económica actual hace que sea necesario pedir este préstamo para respaldar las operaciones actuales de este comercio. Solicitar a través de un banco. Hay una herramienta de búsqueda en el sitio web de SBA para identificar los bancos que participan en el programa. Debido a la alta demanda, muchos bancos han dejado de aceptar solicitudes, aunque eso puede cambiar en los próximos días y semanas. Préstamos por daños económicos, EIDL. Para comercios en funcionamiento al 31 de enero de 2020, préstamos de capital circulante de hasta 2 mi millones de dólares. El préstamo puede ser utilizado para pagar deudas fijas, nóminas, cuentas por abonar y otras facturas que podrían haber sido pagadas si la pandemia no hubiese ocurrido. Aunque los comercios pueden solicitar el préstamo PPP y el EIDL, no se pueden utilizar ambos préstamos para el mismo propósito. Por ejemplo, no se pueden utilizar para cubrir los mismos costos de nóminas durante el mismo periodo. Tasa de intereses, interés del 3, 
0.75% para los comercios con fines de lucro, tasa de interés de 2.75% para comercios sin fines de lucro. Plazo de hasta 30 años, devolución de préstamo diferida por un año, adelanto de emergencia de hasta 10 mil dólares, el cual no tiene, no tiene que ser devuelto, y solicita Solicítelo a través del SBA, spa.gov slash disaster. Pareciera que SBA actualmente no acepta solicitudes, solicitudes debido a falta de fondos, aunque eso puede cambiar en los próximos días o semanas. Ayuda para deudas SBA. SBA está pagando seis meses de tarifas principales, de intereses y otras asociadas que los prestatarios deben por todos los 7A, 504 y micropréstamos actuales que se encuentran en estado de mantenimiento regular y por los nuevos 7A, 504 y micropréstamos desembolsados antes del 27 de septiembre de 2020. Los prestatarios no tienen que solicitar esta asistencia, ya que se brindará de manera automática. Opciones de ayuda que no dependen de SBA. Algunas aparecen en el sitio web de Empire State Development. También consulte a su banco, por ejemplo, eliminar los cargos por demora y por sobregiro. Just gonna ask, just sorry to interject, uh, our fellow board members, panelists, to please Just uh, keep the mute button until it's your turn to speak. Thank you very much. Sorry. Hi, my name is Brie Love. I'm an attorney at Gibson Dunn, and I wanted to discuss some real estate issues and considerations relating to COVID-19 pandemic that's hopefully helpful uh, to you and your business. So I first wanted to cover some mortgage considerations for multifamily properties, which are properties designed for occupancy by five or more families. Under the CARES Act, which was passed back in March, if you have a federally backed multifamily mortgage and you are current on your mortgage payments as of February 1st of 2020, then you may request from your loan servicer a mortgage forbearance, meaning a suspension of your mortgage payments for up to 30 days. And you also have the right to then request for two additional 30-day extension periods thereafter. You must request this before the sooner of the termination date of the national emergency concerning COVID-19 or December 31st of 2020, whichever comes first. If you receive forbearance, then during the duration of receiving that forbearance, you cannot evict any tenants for non-payment of rent or charge tenants any fees, penalties, or other charges for late rent payments. To find out if your loans are federally backed, such as being backed by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, you can check with your loan service provider. And if you're not sure who your loan service provider is, um, you can take a look at your monthly loan statements and they should be listed there. Now, if your mortgage is not backed by, federal, by a federal agency, you should contact your loan servicer to explain your situation and discuss your options. Some lenders are voluntarily offering to um, give these mortgage forbearance programs, even if they're not required. So it's worth a check. Next, I wanted to discuss some rent considerations that the CARES Act also addresses by providing eviction and lay fee protections for tenants. Under these provisions, if a landlord is the owner of a covered property, meaning a property that is insured, guaranteed, supplemented, protected, or assisted in any way by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, by federal financing enterprises such as Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, by the Rural Housing Voucher Program, or by the Violence Against Women's Act of 1994, then the landlords of that covered property are prohibited from evicting tenants and also on charging any late fees for non-payment of rent or other charges. And this lasts for 120 days, which began initially on March 27th and will last until July 25th. Please note this moratorium only applies to evictions for non-payment of rent and not for any other causes. 
and the unpaid rent during this period is not being forgiven, tenants will still be required to pay the accrued rent in full after the moratorium ends. As a renter, you don't have to do anything to get this protection, it's automatic. However, we highly recommend that tenants contact landlords as soon as possible to let them know if the tenant is experiencing economic hardships due to the pandemic and if they're unable to pay their rent due to this cause. In addition to the CARES Act, states have also been taking it upon themselves to take action and offer other forms of relief uh, for real estate matters during the pandemic. So I figured it would be helpful to highlight some New York specific information. So first off in New York, there's currently a moratorium on evictions of any commercial or residential tenant and on foreclosures of any commercial or residential property for 90 days. So this will last through mid-June. Additionally, New York state courts are currently closed except for emergencies and limited virtual appearances. And they are only accepting filings for essential emergency related matters, which do not include foreclosures or eviction matters. So if you have a pending eviction or foreclosure case, then it'll likely be adjourned for 45 days or longer, and you should receive your new court date um, in the mail to that extent. Now, as for rent payments, at this time, there is no suspension on rent policies. As of April 13th, there has been an ongoing campaign asking for a rent moratorium that would include rent on commercial properties, but that has not yet been successful. And there's also been a bill introduced to cancel rent for 90 days, but it has not yet been confirmed into law. So with that said, if you are able, you should plan on trying to pay your rent and otherwise comply with all the other obligations under your lease. Because if you fall behind on the rent, your landlord may be able to file a new case against you in court once the courts actually start accepting these filings. Um, whether that be to evict or to seek payments, um, payments owed. So if you do receive such a notice from your landlord to this effect, please seek legal assistance as soon as possible. And also please understand that each lease and each situation is unique and different. So we highly suggest that you reach out to legal services of NYC for assistance to review your individual leases and assess your individual options. Additionally, various organizations and um, counties in New York are working on various legislations and relief packages to help out residents further during the pandemic. Um, one of these uh, New York City Council is working on legislation to provide further support during the crisis by presenting a relief package that would extend the eviction and foreclosure moratorium on commercial and residential properties um, and the collection of debt until April of 2021, classify any threats to commercial tenants based on their status as COVID-19 impacted business as a form of harassment punchable by a fine ranging from $10,000 to $50,000 by suspending personal liability on commercial leases and suspending annual sidewalk cafe fees. The relief package was announced on April 22nd, and the council is currently holding hearings and voting on the legislation, which will continue over the next couple of weeks, and then will be presented to the mayor for decision within 30 days. So that is ongoing. Um, and I know that was a brief summary of a complex topic, but please know that there's other resources to look into for more information, such as the Gibson Dunn fact document. Um, or even schedule a one-on-one -on -one consultation with legal services of NYC for individual assistance. Alquileres y propiedades comerciales. <clears throat> Hipotecas multifamiliar. A diferencia de las propiedades residenciales, la ley CARES no incluye una moratoria de ejecución de una hipoteca hipoteca relacionado con una propiedad multifamiliar cubierta por una hipoteca federal. Si tiene préstamos hipotecarios multifamiliares respaldados por el gobierno federal y estaba al día con los pagos de la, hipo de la hipoteca al primero de febrero de 2020, entonces puedes pedirle una indulgencia 
de morosidad por hasta 30 días al administrador de préstamos que le otorgó el préstamo. También tiene derecho a solicitar hasta dos periodo, periodos de extensión de 30 días. Debe realizar este pedido antes de lo que ocurre primero entre la fecha de finalización de la emergencia nacional relacionado con la COVID-19 declarada por el presidente Trump o el 31 de diciembre de 2020. Si recibe una indulgencia de morosidad, por el plazo de esta indulgencia de morosidad, los inquilinos no, puede, no podrán ser desalojados por falta de pago de la renta ni se podrán cobrar tasas a inquilinos, penalidades u otros cargos por pagos de renta retrasados. Si su hipo hipoteca no está respaldada por una agencia federal, debe ponerse en contacto con el organismo que le otorgó el préstamo para explicarle su situación y discutir sus opciones. Debe poder identificar al organismo que le otorgó el préstamo en su estado del préstamo mensual. Algunas entidades que crediticias ofrecen de manera voluntaria programas de indulgencia de morosidad de hipotecas similares a lo que se ofrecen en virtud de la ley CARES, aunque no están obligados legalmente a hacerlo. Sobre problemas de renta, de desalojo y protección frente a cargos por demora. Si un propietario es el dueño de la propiedad cubierta, es decir, la propiedad está asegurada, garantizada, suplementada, protegida o recibe una, asiste, una asistencia del Departamento de Vivienda y Desarrollo Urbano de Estados Unidos, US, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, o HUD, de Fannie Mae, de Freddie Mac, del Programa de Asistencia para Viviendas Rurales o de la Ley de Violencia contra la Mujer, Violence Against Women Act, o VAWA, de 1994, dicho propietario no puede desalojar al inquilino ni cobrar cargos por demora por falta de pago de la renta u otros cargos por 120 días. A partir del 27 de marzo 20, 2020 hasta el 25 de julio. La moratoria solo aplica a los desalojos por falta de pago de renta y no a otras causas. No se perdonará la renta que no se pague durante este periodo. Los inquilinos deberá, deberán pagar la renta acumulada completa luego de que termine la moratoria. Como inquilino, no tiene que hacer nada para recibir los beneficios de esta prohibición. Es automática. Sin embargo, le recomendamos que le comunique a su propietario tan pronto como sea posible que anticipa que tendrá problemas económicos debido a la pandemia y que, por lo tanto, no podrá pagar la renta. Sobre la renta y protecciones específica a Nueva York. Actualmente existe una moratoria para los desalojos de cualquier inquilino, sea comercial o residencial y para las ejecuciones de hipotecas de cualquier propiedad comercial o residencial por 90 días hasta mediados de junio. Los juzgados de, lo, de Estado de Nueva York están cerrados, salvo para emergencias y para apariciones virtualme, virtuales limitadas. Si tiene un caso pendiente, se pospondrá administrativamente 45 días o más. Le enviarán una nueva fecha para comparecer ante el juzgado por correo. Los juzgados solo aceptan presentaciones sobre asuntos esenciales o de emergencias. En este momento no existe una, una política de suspensión de la renta en ningún nivel del gobierno. Al 13 de abril de 2020 hay una campaña en vigencia que solicita una moratoria para la renta que incluirá el alquiler de espacios comerciales, pero todavía no ha, tendido, no ha tenido éxito. Se ha presentado un proyecto de ley para cancelar las rentas por 90 días, pero todavía no se ha convertido en ley. Por lo tanto, probablemente tenga que seguir pagando la renta y cumpliendo con las demás obligaciones de su contrato de arrendamiento. Si se atrasa con el pago de la renta, su propietario podría presentar un nuevo caso contra usted en el juzgado cuando los juzgados comiencen a aceptar nuevas presentaciones, ya sea para desalojarlo o para que usted le pague el dinero que le debe.
Si recibe dicha notificación de su propietario para este propósito, busque asistencia legal. Debe entender que cada contrato de arrendamiento y cada situación son únicos y diferentes. Le sugerimos que se ponga en contacto con LSNYC y con Start Small Think Big para recibir asistencia, revisar su contrato de arrendamiento actual y evaluar sus opciones individuales. El Consejo Municipal de Nueva York está trabajando para aprobar una legislación que haría lo siguiente. Extender la moratoria sobre desalojos y recolecciones de deudas comerciales y residenciales hasta abril de 2021. Clasificar las amenazas a los inquilinos comerciales de acuerdo con su estado como comercio o persona afectada por la COVID-19 como forma de acoso sancionable con una multa de 10 mil a 50 mil dólares. Suspender la responsabilidad personal sobre los contratos de arrendamiento comercial y suspender las tarifas anuales de los cafés que tienen mesas sobre la vereda. El paquete de ayuda, de ayuda fue anunciado el 22 de abril del 2020. El consejo realizará audiencias y votará la legislación en las próximas semanas y luego le presentará la legislación al alcalde para que tome una decisión en un plazo de 30 días. One quick question that I have from the public. Can you please repeat the moratorium, the moratorium time frame? Yes, the moratorium time frame. Um, sorry, hold on one second. Are you deeming the moratorium time frame for New York? Yes, that's correct. If you could uh, speak about both briefly, because I know the way we have a Q&A, but before I let you go out, someone just asked. Yes, no problem. So the New York moratorium is for 90 days. So that lasts through mid-June, I believe June 25th uh, or June 20th. And the mortgage, that's the, sorry. So that's the New York moratorium. Um, the eviction moratorium for rent under the CARES Act is for 120 days. And so that lasts until July 25th. Thank you. Thanks, Bree. Uh, my name is Ryan Oranger. I'm an attorney at Gibson Dunn and Crutcher, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, contracts in the context of COVID-19 and sort of what to look for, um, how you might be relieved or excused, or how um, somebody who's contracted to provide you with services might not be uh, relieved, depending on your perspective. So. The rapid spread of COVID-19 has raised concerns about parties' ability to comply with their contractual terms across a variety of industries. Uh, first, we're gonna wanna look to the terms of the contract directly. Did you contemplate delays? Did you contemplate other governance structures in case of any issues? Um, some issues that may be caused by COVID, but not necessarily our inability to perform or inability to get services provided to you. Uh, the expense to perform or the expense of not having services provided to you, project delays and increased costs on either side. Um, so first, before even diving into the contract, it might always be most helpful to open a dialogue. Everyone's going through this pandemic, you might be able to renegotiate your contract or sort of amend it, get additional terms that account for the COVID uh, pandemic. If you do do that and you do come to some agreement that's not within the contract, we definitely advise get that in writing, try to put it into a document, try to get it signed, always keep a clear record of any changes um, or updates you make to your agreements. And if negotiation doesn't seem to be working or doesn't seem to be an option, uh, for guidance, again, you're gonna wanna look specifically to the contract terms um, and probably the most useful term in the contract will be the force majeure clause in this instance. Um, it's the most common way to address obligations in the event of some unforeseeable circumstances, but a force majeure clause, which again, we'll talk about in a second, um, isn't always in the contract. And, and we'll talk about what might happen if there is no force majeure clause. Um, 
but contracts are unique. So, you know, look at your specific fact circumstances and look at the specific terms within your contract to determine, um, you know, whether this is addressed in some way. Um, aside from the force majeure clause, there are other sort of ways um, in your contract or outside of your contract that you might deal with COVID. Uh, if there's business interruption insurance, if you have it, uh, there are also other doctrines of impossibility or frustration of purpose. But these, these other doctrines are sort of less reliable than what you put directly into your contract. A court or a judge, if it ever came to that, is always going to want to enforce what the parties agreed upon instead of overlaying their own sort of idea of what the agreement was. And now one more note before we get into the specifics of force majeure, something to think about is this is important to think about in the context of your existing contracts, but also very important to think about in the context of future contracts, contracts you're about to enter into or are going to enter into. As we can see from this pandemic, we never know what's gonna happen and a good contract can minimize uncertainty. And you should always leak out, uh, see, reach out to legal services to help draft the contract or review your contract. So again, today we're gonna focus specifically on force majeure. Again, force majeure is the clause within the contract that might excuse performance in the event of this unforeseeable event. If you're the provider or the performing party under a contract, you're gonna want a robust force majeure event uh, clause so that, you're excused, that you might be excused in, in some sort of event like this. So you're gonna want, again, if you're the provider, the clause to cover a whole host of different types of situations. If you're receiving services or you're receiving product or you're receiving some sort of um, performance or design for you, um, you're gonna want the force majeure clause to be more narrow so that um, there's less of an argument for excuse on the provider's side and you're more likely to get the benefit of the contract that you signed up for. Um, so force majeure translates literally from French as superior force. It's an event beyond the control of a party. It's an unforeseeable event, which I'll talk about more in a, in a moment. And it may excuse or delay a party's obligations under a contract. It might also provide a party with termination rights under a contract. And those excuses or termination rights may come along with the requirement of notice to be given uh, in the event of a force majeure event. And so we have this uh, four step checklist that we put together that might be helpful in analyzing your own contracts uh, if COVID-19 is a, is a covered um, event for you. Um, and so step one is first to determine whether or not COVID-19 triggers the force majeure clause. Step two is to determine what the standard of performance is if it does trigger the clause. Mm -hmm. Step three is when must notice be given uh, if the clause is triggered. And step four is whether or not there are requirements, specific requirements for the form of notice or how notice is delivered in the event it is triggered. So again, step one, does COVID-19 trigger the force majeure? Well, if you look at your contract and there is no force majeure provision, there's typically not gonna be a force majeure defense. So if you're trying to be excused from a contract uh, and there is no force majeure provision, you're gonna have to rely on something like the doctrine of impossibility or frustration of purpose, which is again, a more difficult avenue, not impossible, but you'd much rather uh, set forth within your contract what uh, you've agreed to upfront, as opposed to having a judge determine what's impossible or impractical under the circumstances. Force majeure is typically when included, uh, include an itemized list and courts will generally not expand upon this list. And so we'll talk in a second about the types of things that are usually within a uh, force majeure clause. Force majeure clauses might also include a catch all phrase, something like uh, and other reasonable and other events beyond the uh, foreseeable, um, I'm sorry, and other events beyond the, um, view of, of, of a party. Um, these catch-all phrases are typically limited again to that list that's usually included within a force majeure. And if you only have a catch-all clause, something that says other you know, unforeseeable events, you might have to prove what you were intending to cover. Again, not a situation you want to be in. You want to sort of list out in your contract all the things you've agreed to up front and not leave any 
interpretation for a judge or a third party. Um, generally, a force majeure clause requires that the non-performing party show that the event was unforeseeable. So it's kind of strange, but some, you know, there have been cases where even when something is listed like a flood, if that flood is foreseeable or uh, a regular occurrence, it may not be within the realm of a force majeure event. So within the context of COVID-19, we're gonna wanna look for phrases like epidemic, pandemic, public health emergency, and other things like that. Um, that would sort of strike the heart of what's happening at the moment. But there are other sort of more commonly included phrases such as government action, actions of civil or military authority, quarantines or, or other items like that. And you should always read carefully what's what the other party or what you wanna put into your force majeure clause. I have actually seen uh, zombies, zombie apocalypse included in a legal document as a force majeure event. So you can get as creative as you want with it depending on what you're sort of concerned about. So then we, so we've, we've determined whether or not the force majeure is in your contract. So if it is, step two is what's the standard of performance? Does the force majeure clause require performance of obligations to be impossible before they're excused? Does it, does it say that they're impractical? Does it require them to be unforeseeable? Again, you're gonna to wanna to look at the specific words of the contract to determine what the standard of performance is. Um, some, some common terms are inadvisable or commercially impractical. Again, if you're the provider or the receiver of services, you're gonna want it to either be broader or more narrow in order to either perform or not have to perform in such a circumstance. So step three, we can look at when must notice be given. So if it's triggered and you determine that, okay, it covers this situation and I, I wanna be excused from performing, then you ask yourself, okay, do I have to give notice? Uh, does it require notice? And you, know, you wanna look at that carefully because if notice is required and you don't provide it, you might not get the benefit of the force majeure clause, even though you otherwise would have had you given the proper notice. And finally, if notice is required, is there a specific method for which you should give notice? Do you have to email? Do you have to phone call? Do you have to send it uh, overnight mail to a specific address? Um, typically, there will be some sort of notice section within a contract. You're gonna to wanna to follow the most formal process you can in this context whenever you're doing something under a contract that is not sort of business uh, as usual day to day. You're gonna to wanna to follow the specific provisions of the contract so that if it ever comes up as a conflict later on or a dispute that needs to be resolved, you have a clear paper trail that you were following the contract, you were abiding by the rules and you were still unable to perform. And again, this is sort of a tough con uh, concept to cover in a group of people where I don't know the specifics of your situations because it, sometimes you're not trying to be excused, but instead you're trying to tell somebody, look, I know what's going on. It, it, it's hard to perform, but I need the benefit of this contract and you need to provide it and you're not excused. Um, you know, you're gonna wanna take everything I'm saying almost flipped depending on which side of this argument you wanna be on. And so this is why it's really important to always reach out um, for legal help to legal services, have a lawyer help with your contracts, have a lawyer help interpret your contracts, um, think of arguments that can help you the most and be the most in your interest. Um, because during this time, it is confusing, there's a lot going on. And so what you don't want to have to deal with is, you know, some other one of your contracting parties or a, a contract that you signed a long time ago, um, dealing with some sort of uh, lawsuit or some sort of dispute. Um, when you could just resolve or potentially resolve the issue based on what's currently in your contract. Esta sección tiene que ver con los contratos y el COVID-19. Los asuntos contractuales causados por el COVID-19, es decir, el coronavirus, uh, incapacidad para cumplir, gastos para cumplir, retrasos en los proyectos y aumento de los costos. Para asesorarse, consulte los términos del contrato, especialmente la cláusula de fuerza mayor. La rápida propagación del COVID-19 ha generado preocupaciones sobre la capacidad de las partes de cumplir los términos de los contratos en diferentes industrias. Primero, consulte los términos del contrato de manera directa. Contempla retrasos, contempla otros, otras estructuras de gobierno en caso de problemas. 
El término más común que trata las obligaciones de las partes bajo estas, estas circunstancias es la cláusula de fuerza mayor, que generalmente, pero no siempre, está incluida en los contratos comerciales. La cláusula de force mayor se traduce literalmente del francés como fuerza superior. Es decir, un evento fuera del control de las partes o eventos impredecibles. Puede eximir o retrasar las obligaciones de un contrato. Puede brindar derechos de rescisión. Puede requerir una notificación del evento para que se otorgue la force majeure. La lista de verificación de cuatro pasos. El primer paso. La COVID-19 activa la clausa de force majeure. El segundo paso. ¿Cuál es el procedimiento estándar? El tercer paso, ¿cuándo debe entregar la, no, la notificación? Y el cuarto paso, ¿hay requisitos asociados con la forma de la notificación o cómo se da esa notificación? Sobre el... Paso uno, ¿la COVID-19 activa la cláusula de fuerza mayor? No existe una disposición de fuerza mayor. No hay defensa de fuerza mayor. Fuerza mayor con lista desglosada. Los juzgados generalmente no expanden esta lista. Fuerza mayor con una frase general y una lista. Los juzgados limitarán el alcance general a los eventos del mismo tipo y naturaleza que los de la lista. Solo hay una frase general y ninguna lista. Una parte podría tener que probar que fue redactada para que cubra este evento. Generalmente, se requiere que la parte incumplidora muestre que el evento era impredecible. Busque frases como epidemia, pandemia, emergencia de salud pública y otras. También busque frases como acción gu gubernamental, acciones de una auto autoridad civil o militar, cuarentenas y otras. Paso 2. ¿Cuál es el procedimiento estándar? La cláusula de fuerza mayor requiere que el cumplimiento de las obligaciones sea imposible antes de que ese examen eximan las obligaciones contractuales. La cláusula de fuerza mayor solo requiere que el cumplimiento sea poco aconsejable o inviable comercialmente. Paso 3. ¿Cuándo debe entregar la notificación? El contrato requiere que se envíe una notificación se debe enviar una notificación oportuna de acuerdo con la disposición de notificación o la rescisión puede no estar disponible, aunque haya ocurrido un evento que la justifique. Paso 4. ¿Hay requisitos asociados con la forma de la notificación? El contrato contiene disposiciones específicas sobre el método de la notificación. El contrato exige un lenguaje específico para redactar la notificación de un evento de fuerza mayor. El contrato aclara un método específico para la entrega de dicha notificación. También es importante consultar un abogado para revisar, revisar su contrato o contratos específicos, a ver cómo resolver, resolver su problema eh, si tiene una cláusula de fuerza mayor o no y cómo resolver por si acaso te encuentras en una situación donde o no puedes cumplir o a otra agencia comprometida usted no puede cumplir. Okay, hi all. Um, I'm Alex. Um, I'm an attorney, also an attorney at Gibson Dunn, and I'm going to be talking with you all about employment law issues during COVID. Um, it's just, this is just going to be like a very brief overview, and there's a lot of, you know, specifics and details that are required to see if your specific business would qualify for all these different types of relief or what types of relief are actually applicable to you. So, Um, again, if you have any questions um, or want more information about your specific businesses, you should reach out to, you know, any, you know, us or Start Small Think Big or Legal Services or whomever, and we can definitely um, provide you with more detailed information pertaining to your actual 
um, business. But um, I'm going to talk about a, a couple of different COVID regulations that have been enacted, both at the federal and state level. But first thought it is um, helpful to acknowledge that all regular um, leave laws in New York still apply. So that means if your business um, is governed by the Family, Le Family Medical Leave Act, which is a federal provision, um, you know, you, those requirements are still in effect. Um, and then for New York specifically, the New York sick leave law remains in effect, which means that um, employees accrue one hour of sick time for every 30 hours worked for a maximum of five, um, 40 hours of sick leave, and well as the New York paid family leave law is in effect. Um, there has been additional guidance regarding the New York paid family leave law, which provides that, um, you can take if um, you're allowed to take a time under that act if you are dealing if your employees are dealing with child care issues. Um, so it provides the ability to care for a dependent child and also gives you time off in addition to time I'm going to discuss later discuss later if you're subject to a mandatory precautionary um, quarantine and you've exhausted the sick leave that's provided under New York State. But just that note, um, New York has really great resources. So honestly, the easiest way to find this out is if honestly Google, if you Google New York State paid family leave to COVID, um, there should be a link that pops up right for, and it'll give you a lot of details as to the information you have to know. And again, you can reach out to us. But um, as many of you know, Governor Cuomo in March put New York State on pause, which means that only essential businesses are allowed to re remain open. Um, there's a more detailed list of what qualifies as an essential business online, but just to give you some examples, food and beverage stores, laundromats for hire drivers such as Uber, taxi drivers, Lyft drivers, certain manufacturers. So if you manufacture medical supplies, you can remain open bodegas, et cetera. Um, so the full list is on the New York State website. If you think you qualify, um, you should go there. And if your business is not explicitly listed, there is a place where you can actually apply for an exception to be deemed an essential business. And New York State will answer your, um, you know, they will give you a determination as to whether or not they believe you are an essential business. So essential businesses are allowed to remain open, but all employees of essential businesses must wear masks and employers are now required to supply those masks to their employees. Um, in addition, if you're an essential business and remaining open, you as an employer must enact um, protocols to ensure that both your employees and your customers are practicing social distancing and maintaining six feet apart. So if you own a food store that could be, you know, posting a sign outside, like remain six feet apart, that could be forming, putting X's on the floor to show how far apart six feet is when people are lining up, making sure your employees aren't standing next to each other, um, et cetera. Um, another thing to note is that the health and safety requirements under OSHA and the general requirements to remain a safe workplace are also still in effect. So um, there's obviously heightened gui guidance, but all of those same prior protocols are also in effect. Um, so those are for essential businesses. All non-essential businesses are required to be physically closed and the entire workforce to the extent possible must work from home. Um, so that's like, you know, my, our law firm's closed, everyone's working from home. If your business does not qualify as one of the essential businesses, um, you either unfortunately must close. Um, and if you're able to work from home, your employees should work from home. And if they're, um, and if they're not able to work from home, um, I'll get to that in a little, a little bit later as to what your requirements are. Um, as you all may have saw last week or a couple, the week before, Governor Cuomo actually outlined a plan as to what how, how New York is going to begin to reopen. It's gonna start with manufacturing and some other industries and then kind of trickle down. There's no concrete information yet as to um, when it will happen. But one of the key things I encourage everyone to do, especially as you're navigating this time is, you know, is to keep checking back to New York State for updates to see if anything has changed and what is opened because things are changing daily. So it's important to stay informed. So um, specifically to COVID, um, New York State did enact paid leave for employees who are under mandatory or precautionary quarantine. Um, and under New York State, the requirements on employers actually depends on the size of your business. So 
for employers with 10 or fewer employees as of January 1 of this year, and your net income is less than $1 million for the previous tax year, so that would be um, the tax year ending in 2019, um, or 2018, if you don't, if you didn't have your 2019 taxes done or numbers yet, each employee is subject to a quarantine must be provided with unpaid sick leave um, through the date of the qualifying order. Um, and then sick leave must be provided to those without loss of an employee's accrued sick leave time. So this is in addition to any other sick leave that your employees would have. You don't have to get paid, but they are, um, they are, they are um, allowed, you have to provide them with sick leave. You're not allowed to deny them sick leave. Um, if you're an employer with 10 or fewer employees and a net income of more than a million dollars, or you have 11 to 99 employees um, and an employee subject to a mandatory um, quarantine order, you must provide your employee with at least five paid sick leave days and then unpaid sick leave through the remainder um, through the remainder of as long as this order is in effect. So um, as many days off as they would need um, in order to recover from COVID. So that is under New York State. Um, under the federal law, which is there's a law that they enacted called Families First Coronavirus Relief Act. They also provide, provide paid leave, um, which is required at the federal level. And this is um, applies to all employers of, who employ 500 employees or less. Um, there are a bunch of requirements here. I'm not going to go into full details on all of them, but again, um, if you Google Families First Coronavirus Relief Act, the DOL has a really helpful Q&A um, and fact page, which would be which will give you some more information. But just to highlight things that might be relevant here, um, businesses with 50 or less employees might actually qualify for certain exemptions, um, and you do not necessarily need to provide um, leave in the instance of school closing or child care closing that would otherwise, you would otherwise be required. So employees that have 50 or more employees and their employees um, have to stay home or take leave because their schools, their, um, their child's school has closed because of the coronavirus, um, they are actually entitled to leave under this act. But if you have 50 or less employees and it would be detrimental to the viability of your business, you may qualify for this exemption. Otherwise, this act provides up to 80 hours of leave at the regular rate of pay if an employee is unable to work because he or she is quarantined and potentially up to 12 weeks of paid leave at two thirds of the rate of their pay if they need to take leave to care for a child who is no longer able to go to school or whatever child care they would normally go to. Um, so as Dan mentioned earlier, there is um, unemployment insurance available for all of your employees. And if you are self-employed, you are actually now able to qualify for unemployment insurance under New York. Um, New York State has waived the seven day waiting period um, so that you should definitely go and apply. I understand from you know a lot of friends I have that you know there's, I think, long wait. So just be patient and know that um, the date you apply is the date that your application should be processed. So even if it takes a little while, um, they will process your application in due course and um, provide you with benefits. Under a, a federal act called the CARES Act, which Congress passed a couple of weeks ago, in addition to the unemployment benefits you're entitled to under New York state law, you're actually also entitled to an additional $600 a week um, under the federal law and you, the federal law actually provides you with additional weeks pay. So under New York, you're normally entitled to 26 weeks, but under the federal law, you can actually get up to 39 weeks um, of, un, of in, unemployment insurance. So that will be helpful um, for um, employees. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, so you know, if you are either both an essential or non-essential business, um, what is your requirement to continue to employ your employees? And what is your requirement with regards to paying employees while they might be working from home or not working or whatnot? Um, 
number, the first thing to note is employers are actually under no obligations to retain employees. Although as Ben did mention earlier, if you are applying for a PPP loan, um, you do have to retain all of your full-time employees in order to actually qualify for loan forgiveness. So that's something, um, that is something to note, but to the extent, you know, you are not applying for a PPP loan or are willing to, you know, forego some of that loan forgiveness, um, you're not required to retain um, any employees. Um, however, if you do have employees, um, even if they're in there, let's say they're working from home, you are still required to pay them if they're working part time or only certain hours. Um, your requirements and how much they have to get paid will depend on whether or not they're exempt or non exempt employees and how the payment structure is. So um, to the extent you have specific questions about how to compensate employees based on a new work schedule um, or whatnot, you should definitely reach out to us and we would be happy to provide you with um, some additional guidance. But again, um, there's a lot to cover um, in terms of employment. This is kind of just an overview of things you should think about while, um, you know, while making certain employment decisions. And um, to the extent you have any additional questions, we'd be happy to, you know, connect you with the right person to help answer them. But I think I will turn it over now to the translators. Thank you all. Esta sección tiene que ver con el, las leyes de empleo. Uh, un recordatorio. Además de las regulaciones relacionadas con la COVID-19, todas las leyes de ausencia justificada regulares de Nueva York siguen vigentes. La FMLA, la Ley de Licencia por Enfermedad de la Ciudad de Nueva York, NYC Sick Leave Law, la Ley de Licencia Familiar Paga de Nueva York, New York Paid Family Leave Law. La Licencia Familiar Paga de Nueva York puede pedirla si la persona está sujeta a una cuarentena obligatoria o preventiva, o si ya pidió la licencia por enfermedad, como se explica a continuación. También le brinda tiempo si necesita cuidar a un hijo dependiente. Detención del Estado de Nueva York. Solo los comercios esenciales pueden permanecer abiertos, es decir, tiendas de comidas y bebidas, lavanderías, conductores de alquiler, algunos fabricantes, bodegas. Eh, la lista completa se encuentra en el sitio de web del estado de Nueva York. Si no sabe si califica como comercio esencial, puede buscar la lista y también en el sitio de web puede aplicar a ser determinado un comercio es esencial. Los empleados de comercios esenciales deben utilizar máscaras. Los empleadores las deben suministrar. Seguridad del empleado y requisitos de salud. Los empleadores, empleadores tienen la obligación general de mantener la seguridad en los espacios de trabajo en virtud de las regulaciones de la OSHA. OSHA. Los empleadores deben tomar medidas para asegurar el distanciamiento social para los empleados y los clientes. Los comercios no esenciales deben cerrar físicamente y los empleados deben trabajar desde su hogar si es posible. La semana pasada, el gobernador Cuomo estableció un plan para comenzar a volver a abrir a Nueva York, por lo que debe estar atento a las actualizaciones periódicas. Licencia paga por COVID-19. El estado de Nueva York ofrece licencias pagas para los empleados que están bajo cuarentena obligatoria o preventiva y o están cuidando a menores dependientes debido a que su escuela, centro de cuidado, cerró debido al COVID-19. Los requisitos para otorgar la licencia paga dependen del tamaño del comercio. Los, empleado, los empleadores con 10 o menos empleados al 1 de enero de 2020 con un ingreso neto de menos de un millón de dólares en el año fiscal anterior deben otorgarle a cada empleado sujeto a una orden de cuarentena una licencia por enfermedad sin goce de sueldo hasta la fecha de finalización de la orden adecuada. Se debe otorgar la licencia por enfermedad sin que el empleado pierda la licencia por enfermedad acumulada. Los empleadores con 10 o menos empleados al 1 de enero de 2020 con un ingreso neto de más de un millón de dólares en el año fiscal anterior 
o los empleadores con 11 a 19 empleados al, un, al primero de enero del 2020 deben otorgarle a cada empleado sujeto a una orden de cuarentena, una licencia por enferma, enfermedad paga de al menos cinco días y una licencia sin goce de sueldo hasta la fecha de finalización de dicha orden. La ley de ayuda por el coronavirus Las Familias Primero, Families First Coronavirus Relief Act, también brinda licencias pagas al nivel federal. Los comercios son con 50 o menos empleados califican para algunas extensiones y no están obligados a otorgar licencias si las escuelas cierran o por cuidado de niños si el cumplimiento justificaría la viabilidad del comercio. De lo contrario, la FFCRA otorga hasta 80 horas de licencia a una tarifa de pago regular si el empleado no puede trabajar porque está en cuarentena y potencialmente hasta 12 semanas de licencia paga a una tarifa doble o triple para cuidar a un niño. Seguro del empleo. El estado de Nueva York brinda seguros de desempleo y eliminó el periodo de espera de siete días. También está otorgando seguros para los trabajadores autónomos. La ley CARES les otorga a los desempleados 600 dólares adicionales semanales y la posibilidad de obtener un seguro de desempleo para las semanas adicionales. Despidos de empleados pago a los empleados mientras los comercios permanecen cerrados. Los empleadores no tienen la obligación de retener a los empleados, aunque esto tendría consecuencias si el comercio quiere calificar para un préstamo PPP, como Ben mencionó antes. Si sus empleados están trabajando, incluso de forma remota, debe compensarlos por su trabajo. Aplican estándares distintos, lo que depende de si su empleado está ex exento o no. Uh, I'm going to speak very briefly about tax issues and then maybe a little less briefly about insurance. Uh, the IRS and New York State have extended the deadline for tax filings for individuals and businesses to July 15th. You may also be eligible for tax credits to cover certain costs of providing employees uh, with required paid sick leave and expanded family and medical leave. It's important to speak with a tax professional, but if you have a legal tax issue, uh, we have volunteer attorneys who may be able to advise you. In addition to Start Small, Think Big, one of our other community partners, Neighborhood Trust Financial Partners, also provides financial coaching and resources to reach legal services, um, please contact us directly um, or contact Start Small, Think Big. Voy a hablar brevemente sobre los impuestos y no tan brevemente sobre los seguros. Primero los impuestos. El servicio de impuestos internos en la IRS y el estado de Nueva York extendieron la fecha límite para las declaraciones de impuestos para las personas y comercios hasta el 15 de julio 2020. Puede ser elegible para recibir créditos fiscales destinados a cubrir algunos costos al otorgarle a los empleados licencias por enfermedad, pagas requeridas y licencias familiares y médicas extendidas. Es importante que hable con su profesional impositivo, pero si tiene problemas impositivos relacionados con los impuestos, contamos con abogados voluntarios que podrían asesorarlo. Además del Start Small Think Big, uno de nuestros socios comunitarios, Neighborhood Trust Financial Partners, también brinda asesor asesoramiento y recursos financieros. Deben comunicarse con servicios legales de Manhattan directamente acerca de estos asuntos. Uh, you may have insurance that covers losses caused by COVID-19. Your insurance may cover commercial property, business interruption, lost profits, additional expenses, general liability, claims by third parties for personal injury and property damage, event cancellation, and more. After the SARS outbreak in 2002, many insurance companies excluded coverage for certain types of outbreaks in their policies. 
the specific language of the policy is very important here because it may seem to exclude your claim when in fact COVID-19 is not excluded. Every insurance policy is different and it's important to make decisions based on the language in your specific policy. If you think you have a claim, you should notify your insurance company right away because insurance policies have deadlines, some that are very short. If you were denied, appeal the decision in writing. Under New York state law, once the insurance company provides its reasons for denial, it cannot come back with new reasons. Whether you have a claim now or not, you should do a number of things. Uh, you should start a journal or maybe an email chain with yourself specific to your insurance issues and put everything you do and all the information you learn in that journal. Keep notes with the names of the people you speak to, the date and time of the conversations and the details of the conversation. Review your policies closely. Find out uh, what you are required to do if you have a claim and find out what the deadlines are. Look for language in the policy that may exclude certain claims like virus exclusions. Talk to an attorney about the terms. You can contact Manhattan Legal Services at 917-661-4500. Keep good records moving forward. For instance, detailed financial statements can clearly show the difference between your expected revenue and your actual revenue. Keep track of all costs, particularly additional or unusual, unusual costs like overtime pay, cleaning products, and production expenses. Mitigate your damages. Your insurance policy may require you to minimize your losses and or damage. For example, continue operating at a lower level and renegotiate contracts if possible. Talk to your broker to ensure that they agree with your understanding of the policy and answer questions that you have. And again, if you have a claim, you need to notify the insurance company as soon as possible. Esta sección tiene que ver con los seguros. Puede tener un seguro que cubra las pérdidas causadas por el COVID-19. Su seguro podría cubrir la propiedad comercial, la interrupción comercial, las ganancias perdidas, los gastos adicionales, la responsabilidad general, las reclamaciones de terceros por daños personales y daños a la propiedad, la cancelación de eventos y más. Luego del brote de SARS de 2002, muchas compañías aseguradoras excluyeron la cobertura para ciertos tipos de brotes en sus pólizas. En esto, el lenguaje específico de la póliza es muy importante porque podría parecer que excluye su reclamación cuando en realidad el COVID-19 no está excluida. Cada póliza de seguro es diferente y es importante que tome decisiones basadas en el lenguaje de su póliza específica. Si cree que puede presentar una reclamación, debería notificar a su asegurador de inmediato porque las políticas de seguro tienen fechas límite y algunas son muy cortas. Si notifica a su asegurador sobre una reclamación, debe recolectar toda la información que tenga para respaldar su, clima, su reclamación. Si le rechazan, apele la decisión por escrito. De acuerdo con la ley del estado de Nueva York, una vez que el asegurador le proporciona las razones de rechazo, no puede brindarle razones nuevas. Sin importar si desea presentar una reclamación ahora o no, debería hacer lo siguiente. Uh, número uno, redactar un acto o una cadena de correo electrónica específica para los asuntos del asegurador y anotar todo lo que hace y toda la información que recopila ahí. Número dos, revisar las pólizas con detenimiento. Número tres, determinar lo que debe hacer si quiere presentar una reclamación. Número cuatro, Determinar cuáles son las fechas límite. Número 5. Buscar frases en la póliza que excluyan algunas reclamaciones, como exclusiones sobre virus. Número 6. Hablar con un abogado sobre los términos. Número 7. Mantener buenos registros a, med a medida que avanza. 
Por ejemplo, los estados financieros detallados pueden mostrar de manera clara la diferencia entre los ingresos esperados y sus ingresos actuales. 8. Controlar todos los costos, particularmente los costos adicionales o insunales. Inusuales. El pago de horas extra, los productos de limpieza, las pérdidas en la producción, por ejemplo. Número 9. Mitigar los daños. Su, su póliza de seguro puede requerir que minimice sus su pérdidas o daños. Por ejemplo, continúe operando a un nivel más bajo de ser posible. Vuelva a negociar los contratos que existen. Número 10. Hable con su agente para asegurarse de que están de acuerdo con su comprensión de la póliza y de que respondan las preguntas que tiene. Y 11. Registre los nombres de las personas con las que habló, la fecha y la hora de la conversación y los detalles de las conversaciones. Dan, I think you're next. Or are you going to wrap up so we can go into our Q&A? Um, yeah, that was pretty much the end for our um, analysis of the different issue areas. Um, and I think we're just about ready for Q&A. Um, before we uh, go into Q&A, I just want to uh, express my gratitude to you, Dan, for uh, bringing this team together. Katie, uh, thank you very much uh, for all your work, um, all the participants, uh, Bree, uh, Alexandra, Ben, uh, Alex, uh, who else? Am I? And Ryan, uh, thank you for uh, for joining this um, uh, event uh, on behalf of uh, your uh, respective organizations and uh, uh, for uh, trying to assist uh, the Washington Heights and Inwood uh, communities um, and bringing uh, such valuable information. Uh, and uh, also to Eliasar, Eliasar, thank you for your leadership in uh, bringing this up to uh, Community Board 12. And just in case, uh, let me just, I did not introduce myself. I'm William Garcia. I'm a, a member of the Board of Directors of Manhattan Legal Services and a former chair of Community Board 12 and a member of the Board of Directors of uh, other organizations in the community. Okay, perfect. So uh, let's initiate uh, our Q&A. I see that Janish has her hand up. Uh, Janish, you could speak. Janish. Uh, let me see. Okay. Um, I know that there was a question. There's four questions here. Um, Loris Tobias Cohen, could Bree please review what's being proposed by the city council to assist renters? Sure. Yeah, uh, the New York City Council, I know is a mouthful, um, but they're currently putting forth legislation that does, goes with like four different matters to help people suffering during the crisis. One of them would be extending the eviction and foreclosure moratorium for commercial and residential properties until April of 2021. Um, and that includes also collection of debt. And they're also moving to classify any threats to commercial tenants based on their status as a COVID-19 impacted business as being a form of harassment that would warrant a fine and that could range from anywhere from 10,000 to 50,000. Um, and also suspending personal liability on commercial leases and suspending any annual sidewalk cafe fees. Okay. And so th that's what the relief package entails and they're currently uh, holding hearings and voting on that right now. Uh, and then we have Maria Figueroa with a question about PPP loan. Once the loan is approved, when the fund is available, when is the fund available? And if it can be put on hold until restaurant can be reopened according to the phase is being put. 
I'm not sure what that means. Sure, and I can take this one uh, since I spoke to the PPP loans. So as to the first question, once the loan is approved, when is the funds available? Unfortunately, it's hard to say with any certainty how quickly the loan uh, disbursement happens. As mentioned earlier, it's a two-step process where you as a small business owner will submit your application to a bank. The bank then submits that information to the SBA to give final approval. And then the bank comes back to you as the small business owner with the loan disbursement. So a lot of it depends on individual banks that you're working with, as well as the uh, competing demands that the SBA is facing. That being said, the program has been in effect for over a month now. Many businesses have received the funds and the, those have been dispersed. I personally have spoken with small business owners who have applied for the PPP loan and received it. Um, so using that limited experience to go on, uh, you know, we're looking at a timeline of weeks, but again, it's hard to say with any certainty since demand is so high and things seem to be changing on a daily basis. As for the second question, can the loan be put on hold until the restaurant can be reopened according to the phases being uh, put? So the, the short answer to that is one of the benef one of the main benefits of the PPP loan is the loan forgiveness. And the loan forgiveness is keyed to the period after the loan is dispersed. So it's calculated for that eight week period after loan disbursement. So if you want to take advantage of the loan forgiveness terms of the PPP loan, you're using those funds within the first eight week period to maximize that benefit. You know, we would have to look in more detail to see if there's further limitations to putting it on hold. Um, presumably you can extend beyond that eight week period, but you wouldn't be eligible for that full loan forgiveness amount unless you're using the funds in the first eight weeks after disbursement. Thank you. Um, and now uh, we have another question from Lori Tobias Cohen. For Ben, if a sole proprietor registers for UI, does that prohibit them from going after a PPP loan? Sure. And so the reference to UI here is presumably unemployment insurance. And Again, we, we would need to, you know, I, I'm always prone to double check before giving a definitive answer, but I suspect with a high degree of certainty that a sole proprietor cannot receive both unemployment insurance and a PPP loan, um, in particular because with unemployment insurance, at least within the state of New York, one of the requirements is that you, uh, you, you have to actively be searching for work uh, while you're receiving those benefits and turning down an offer of sorts in the PPP loan in order to maintain your business would be at odds with um, eligibility for unemployment insurance. So again, can't say definitively without looking a bit more right now, but I'm pretty certain that uh, unemployment insurance and PPP loan cannot be received simultaneously. Perfect. Now, um, on that note, one thing that I've noticed about the PPP is that um, understanding that there is uh, the ability to have a loan forgiveness, but also um, one thing I find that's very important for businesses to know is being able to take a loan at a very minimal interest rate. And I think like this provides an opportunity where a lot of businesses could take these loans to stay afloat and get a good interest rate to be able to have that extra cash flow once they start uh, embarking in that reopening process. And could somebody speak to um, the interest rate? And if a business wasn't necessarily going after the, the forgiveness component, um, what benefits is there in taking a loan, uh, a PPP loan um, with those in low interest rates? 
Sure, I'll just I'll just go for it again, unless somebody <laughs> else wants to chime in, uh, which is uh, beyond the loan forgiveness. The terms are favorable. It's a two year loan term that would need to be repaid within at a 1% interest rate, which is a low interest rate relative to other uh, other loans. And on top of that, the loan repayment period is deferred for the, the first six months. So you would have a period where uh, you don't need to repay it. Um, so I agree with that. There are favorable terms that go beyond the loan forgiveness with the PPP loan. And Ben, I'll just jump in there. Um, one of the things um, I noticed there were a couple of comments. Um, one of the things is here is, and Katie can correct me on behalf of Gibson Dunn, but um, for specific questions where you're asking about your specific situation, you won't be able to reach out directly to the attorneys on the call or, or to the law firm. Um, but you will be able to work with attorneys either like them or, or the exact same ones through the program that, that Dan and I work with here with the rapid response program or through talking with Dan directly with Legal Services New York. Uh, and one of the services that's available through the rapid response program specifically, um, if you apply, is a chance to talk not just with attorneys, but with financial professionals, volunteers from hedge funds and large banks who've, who've agreed to sit down and help you talk through things like whether or not the loans have an appropriate structure for you, whether the repayment term of two years is appropriate, whether 1% is worth that shorter repayment term, uh, how much you should ask for if it's going to be a loan and not be forgiven, and whether or not your cash flow is likely to be able to support that in the long run uh, in what is likely to be a recessionary environment subsequently. Um, there are a lot of complicated questions and they link together both things that you want to talk to a financial professional and a lawyer about. Uh, and if you go through that website, um, either through legal services, nyc.org or start small think big .org, and you find and you go through that application, you'll be able to talk to not just one person, but multiple people for 45 minutes to 90 minutes each time. Uh, and you'll be routed through those meetings so that you're able to get direct service that actually applies exactly to your business, uh, even beyond this, um, you know, Q and A level uh, back and forth. Perfect. Yeah, uh -huh. thanks, Alex. Um, and yes, our you know Ben, Bree, Alex, and um, Ryan are all happy, I think, to help um, small businesses and nonprofits generally. And um, but I think you know LSNYC and Start Small Think Big are so good at um, what they do, and we love working with them and through them. So to the extent that anyone on this call or or anyone in the community has questions that probably make sense to route them, as Alex said, through one of those organizations. And then we are always happy to take referrals and, and help and work with as many, as many as you as we can. So thanks, Alex. Uh, thank you. We also have, I believe this is a statement from a uh, Lori Tob Tobias Cohen. Um, Congressman Espaya staff is able to help with uh, difficulties of applying for an employment. If people have been frustrated with their attempts to apply, they are welcome to leave a message at 212-497-5959. That's 212-497-5959. I know here we have, uh, if there's any questions from my committee, um, I know it's Isidro's here um, and anybody else before we start wrapping up the event. Going once. Let me just make one quick statement uh, as far as, you know, being a business owner myself and how tough the application process has really been, has really been for us, uh, especially with a lot of the paperwork that, you know, the government and the SBA and, and, and all those other agencies are requiring us to provide them with W3s, 940s, 941As, you know, a, a, a very intensive uh, uh, paperwork that is really, you need an accountant to fill it out. There's not something that we as business owners can ourselves produce. I think uh, I'd like to thank you again for the clarity on Dan on your, on your side as to, you know, the language of, of, of uh, the insurance coverage. You know, what means what, you know, what's a pandemic? Uh, what what really is uh, how COVID now is different than it was COVID SARS. So I think it's I, now I have a greater idea because I have a, a, an insurance myself. So I'm going to kind of like have you guys help me up 
uh, kind of like maneuver and work through it. So uh, thank you, Domingo, for the chance. But thank you again for for being here, give us some, some giving us some clarification. Yeah, we're happy to help. Okay, Cedro has a question. Give me okay. More like Cedro. a statement. Uh, thank you, Domingo, uh, for putting this together along with uh, the chair of the board, uh, Eli Bueno. Uh, very happy and really uh, surprised as to the amount of uh, clarity that was uh, that was brought up uh, by your panelists. So very grateful for all the resources that you guys provided. As you know, the community has a lot of challenges, but also a lot of opportunities. And I'm very grateful to uh, have been part of this uh, conversation. So thank you so much for all. Um, and I believe that's the last question. I want to thank all, all the panelists. Um, it was very insightful. Uh, the beauty of this platform is now that people could basically reuse it and be able to reference it uh, moving forward. Um, I think a lot of information was provided. A lot of insight was provided. Um, the the du the fact that it was dual language made it even uh, a much better experience as people will be able to reference this um, moving forward. I want to say thank you. Um, on behalf of the Business Development Committee, we appreciate everybody participating. Uh, Mr. William Garcia, thank you for the support that you provided in this process. And Eliezer, um, thank you for just making sure you connected the dots. Um, Isidro, thank you for participating. I want to thank my committee for also being here. Um, Ashley, uh, Tanya, Ru, Jonathan, um, and anybody I might have missed. Appreciate you all and hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.